everybody, and welcome back to the General Eclectic Podcast with Rod Dreer. I'm your host, Kale Zeldin, and uh, very excited uh, for today's podcast because we are bringing on a, a friend of Rod's and hopefully a friend of mine now, um, and, and, and a great and important cultural historian in Carl Truman. Um, Rod, uh, what's going on before we, before we bring Carl in? How you doing over there, brother? I'm doing great. Great. A great weekend traveling uh, with one yes. of our our, our 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 listeners of our podcast oh nice Ed Greer from Birmingham Alabama he has a small plane flew down picked me up we flew to Nashville we flew to a <laughs> fishing camp in northern Alabama and sat around drinking bourbon and uh, uh and telling lies all weekend it was a perfect very, very manly weekend I, I was <laughs> it was a lot of fun it was a lot of oh, fun that's great that's and great. and I'm coming home now and I, I I'm somewhat disappointed I uh I wanted to get the world's finest baker of shortbread, Katrina Truman, on the show, but she couldn't make it, so she sent her husband, Carl, and I guess we'll have to make do with him. You've started a trend of me being introduced as Katrina Truman's husband at conferences now. It's happened at least twice, I think, since I was at Touchstone. Oh, no, that's, that's awesome. No, no kidding. <laughs> Carl's, uh, Carl's wife, Katrina, sent me some of her shortbread a couple of years ago, and it was just... I would take it to the kids and say, kids, taste this. Can you believe cookies can taste so good? And now it's become this thing. And uh, I, I'm I'm really, really, I, I can't say enough good things about it. I wish we could spend the whole podcast talking about shortbread. But fortunately, we have cultural collapse ahead of yes. us. Yes. <laughs> so, um, Carl, we're so glad to have you here. Your book, um, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self, is um, just spectacular um there's this very prescient young scholar who wrote the foreword uh who told it called it one of the most important books of our time to help us help the church understand modernity i was i was the young scholar yes. who wrote that <laughs> um uh can you tell us, Carl, let's start by talking about the basic thesis of the book because this cultural crisis uh, uh, despite what many conservatives and many christians may think it didn't start in the 1960s no, I mean, the basic thesis of the book is that if you want to understand the, the very rapid and dramatic changes that are taking place in culture today, specifically, uh, but not exclusively focused on the sexual revolution, mm -hmm. uh, you need to set contemporary events, contemporary changes, contemporary transformations of thought against a much larger backdrop, a narrative that really goes back at least several hundred years and see how what Charles Taylor calls the social imaginary, the way we intuitively imagine or relate to the world, how that has been slowly but surely transformed, really, certainly since the Enlightenment, uh, probably since the Reformation, arguably since the late medieval period, there's been a dramatic transformation of the way we think about the world, driven partly by ideas, partly by technology. Uh, and this really provides the large background to such things as gay marriage, transgenderism, the kind of things that are currently uh, roiling uh, contemporary society. You know, I, I remember back in 2005, I think it was, when uh, George W. Bush had just been reelected. The Republicans held the Senate. They tried to bring uh, forth some Republicans in the Senate, Senator Rick Santorum of Pennsylvania the, taking the lead there, to pass a, a constitutional amendment uh, saying that traditional marriage, one man, one woman exclusively, was uh, put it in the Constitution. Even though the Republicans controlled all the levers of power in Washington, they could not even get this out of the Senate to pass, to send to the states. That's when I decided that the whole gay marriage thing is over. And even though there were strong majorities in most states who were against same-sex marriage, uh, it struck me as a reader of Philip Reef that it was it, thing, things were gone, that we were going to have gay marriage in this country. Why would Philip Reef have been essential, someone essential to know to be able to read the signs of the times? Yeah, well, Philip Reef, he, he's not the easiest guy to read. Yeah. I mean, he, he didn't That's write sure. particularly well. He's a, he's a tough guy to, to sort of chew through when you're reading. But I think there are two two basic insights he has that are particular relevance to the point you just made, Rod. First of all, he identifies the rise of what he calls the therapeutic society. I mean, he's writing, he writes his book, the, the Triumph of the Therapeutic in 1966. So he's writing this uh, over half a century ago. 
but he identifies a fundamental change in the way that society thinks about the self uh, that has become really obsessed or focused upon an inner sense of psychological happiness. And one of the things sort of sociological points Reef draws from that is that, that changes everything. It changes, for example, how we think institutions should operate. Institutions cease to be places which we have to fit into where we have to be formed in order to belong. And institutions really become those things that serve our, our sense of well-being. So for example, marriage as an institution gets transformed into something that helps me feel good about myself. It's not necessarily about producing children. It's not about the benefits of society at large. It becomes focused upon the personal benefits to me in particular. So the rise of the therapeutic society was something that Reef put his finger on. The second thing is, is a point that emerges in his later work. Uh, really, I think in his post, you know, the work that's been published posthumously. The, and that's the idea that uh, for societies to organize themselves, so there to be a social order, typically social orders depend upon a sacred order. In other words, how societies are organized is justified on the basis beyond on a basis beyond those societies. We might think of Old Testament Israel. You know, why does Old Testament Israel organize itself the way it does? Because God tells them to do so. They are to reflect God's character. Their social order is to reflect the sacred order of God's character. We could think of ancient Sparta. Why is Spartan society organized along the weird lines that it is? Well, the oracle at Delphi gave the law to the first king Lycurgus, and he organized a society along uh, lines that have been willed by the gods. We now live in a situation where there is no agreed sacred order. There is nothing beyond society to which we as a society as a whole can appeal for the moral and social ordering of how we live. And that creates a situation that is very unstable, very pragmatic, and constantly reinventing itself. And I think on those two points, Reef is, is very depressing to read, but also very prescient in terms of what is going on in society at the moment. You know, I, I remember reading Triumph of the Therapeutic and uh, Reef saying that the sexual revolution was more important than the Bolshevik revolution. Now, he was writing this in the mid 20th century when the Bolshevik revolution was still going great guns in, in, yeah. in, in, the, in the Soviet bloc. Um, can you tell us what the roots of the therapeutic are like in the 19th century, in the early 20th century? Just uh, I want to give our listeners a, a sense that, um, again, this doesn't the, the current crisis didn't just uh, spring forth from the head of the 1960s. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you can trace the the origins of the therapeutic back to what what historians and sociologists often call the the inward turn. Now, whether you see the inward turn as taking place in the late Middle Ages, the Reformation, the early Enlightenment, essentially what's being said there is that at some point in in Western history in the last five or six hundred years, people started to think about their identity or started to move their identity more into the inner space. You know, if you think you were born in the Middle Ages, your identity would really have been given to you. You'd have been born, baptized, married and buried probably in the same church. Yeah. Uh, you would never have moved more than 10 or 15 miles away from home. Your career options would have been determined for you at birth. You're going to be a peasant farmer. You're going to be a knight in shining armor. You're going to be king. Really depends on what your your father did. Uh, yeah. and, and in Sorry, you're going to ask something? Yeah, I was just, you know, I, I, I think as a maybe a way of illustrating this to our audience is that I think the, the pivotal figure for me is, is um, and I don't mean to be overly cute here, but the pivotal, the pivotal figure is really Hamlet. Um, you know, I, I'm always struck by Harold Bloom uh, claims, you know, that, that, that Shakespeare invented the human. Um, and I think what he's sort of getting at here is kind of what you're talking about here, Carl, is that at a certain point, Wherever you date it, it's you know it's going to be somewhat inchoate and 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 it's going to be somewhat of a sort of a a, 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 a a framing mechanism that we're kind of making up here. But but Hamlet seems to occupy this you know old Hamlet in in the story is is an old medieval king and new Hamlet studying at Wittenberg interestingly mm, enough yes um, becomes this pivotal figure where he it's a, it's a turn into the self as as you're talking about and that's why I think Hamlet. 
Um, I think, you know, I just saw a production of, of Hamlet, uh, of really a fantastic production of Hamlet t- two Fridays ago. And I was struck at, w- with the notion of what would Hamlet do with our queer moment? Because I think he would have plenty to say because I think he thought it all already. <laughs> you're you're going to queer Hamlet, aren't you, Kale? No, no, quite the contrary. Target, dot, no, target, no, no right. quite the contrary. I, I think that that Hamlet um, is is exactly, you know, he he's wrestling with the real, and 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 it seems to me that in our current moment, it's sort of picking up with what Carl's talking about here is that we are we seem to be in a flight from the real. Yeah, and, 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 and you, I had not thought of that, but Hamlet is is a great example of the opening up of that inner space, mm-hmm. that that he's really the man who lives in his head. Yeah. Uh, in some ways, a sort of anticipation of some of the great heroes in Dostoevsky or anti-heroes Absolutely. in Dostoevsky. Absolutely. Absolutely. I've just read Notes from Underground oh. with a bunch of students at, oh. uh, at uh, Grove, and Masterful. they were startled at how mm-hmm. contemporary yeah. that uh, that book seemed to be. But you know, to return to Rod's question, as soon as you open up that inner space, as soon as you really start identifying yourself as as what you feel rather than the external relations you have, the trajectory is set towards the therapeutic because mm-hmm. ultimately, uh, life, the quality of life, who you are, is going to be shaped by by how you feel. Mm-hmm. Of which, uh, as Kayla's point, you know, our queer moment is in some ways the most extreme example of that. You can be whoever you feel you are. You know, Cale uh, brought up Hamlet. I, it, what brought to mind, what brought that, uh, sorry, what came to my mind when, uh, when he said that is the thesis, I forget the guys, Eric Auerbach, I think his name is, yeah. he's a literary critic who wrote a book called Dante, Poet of the Secular World. Mm-hmm. And in this study, he says that Dante was the hinge figure between the medieval and the modern, because you can read in the Divine Comedy, he's taking in a lot of the old um, the old themes and tropes from the medieval world, but he is bringing them into the quote unquote real world by mixing things up in his, in his uh, comedia. You know, he's going through the underworld and he's meeting mythical figures as well as people from real life. Right. Uh, Auerbach says at the end of his book that only 40 years separates the death of Dante from the birth of Petrarch. But yeah. in that 40 yeah. years, yeah. the world, the Western world turned and mm-hmm. it made the turn that you speak of, Carl, to the interior. Um, and uh, so the, the reason I bring that up is because so many of our Catholic friends like to say, well, the problems all started with the Reformation. Right. 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 Reading Auerbach and reading Dante made me understand that, no, the Reformation got started with that turn. And of course, with the, the corruption in, um, in, in the, the, the Roman Catholic Church. But the, the, the key point here is that society and culture in the West had already turned 200 years before Martin Luther took the took his theses to the Wittenberg door. Am I right or wrong there, Carl? Well, it's, it, it goes back to a review I did some years ago, of Brad Gregory's book, The Unintended Reformation, where mm-hmm. I, I really argue there that you know, Gregory sees late medieval Catholicism and Reformation as, as the degeneration. And, and my review sort of said, you know, actually, I think the Reformation is a response to what's mm-hmm. already gone on. You, you're seeing this interior space being opened up. So... I think you're you're substantially correct there, Rod. I think that yeah. we have to date this prior to the Reformation. But of course, the the big watershed for the inner space then becomes the death of God. It's okay to have an inner space. I right, mean, we right. have the Psalms in the Bible, for example. <clears throat> exactly. Yeah, right. We, Amen. Yeah. We have Augustine's Confessions. Yeah. What really happens in in and it's really the 19th century more than the 18th is that the move inward becomes a move inward for augustine the move inward terminates in a move outward ultimately to, the to inward space has to be defined in relation to god which is, which is I think, to, and that's sorry. herbert and that's herbert's point in uh, the pulley right is that even in my pulling away i, I I'm, I'm pulling myself toward toward i you know ultimately i get back to god so from herbert's framing of it in that poem god is inevitable in 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 some very real way um, for, for for him. Yeah, I think so. It's it's sort of unimaginable for these right. guys that that would right. not be the case. Mm-hmm. By the time you get to the 19th century, though, you really have 
you know, the inner space untethered from any external authority, at least in the minds of certain intellectuals. It takes some time for that to percolate down to, to the masses, but conceptually it's becoming possible to think of that inner space as truly autonomous. And so we we get from that point to the metaverse today. When I was talking with some friends over the weekend about the world that seems to be coming into being via technology, where one can uh, sit in one's chair, put on the VR the VR device, mm -hmm. and uh, live in this completely invented world, and and have that be your primary experience of reality. Of course, it's not reality, but people are. It seems to me they are becoming conditioned to accept the pleasant but unreal, the pleasant lie to the complicated and messy reality. Yeah, I mean, it gives a new twist to uh, Neil Postman's title, Entertaining right. Ourselves to right. Death. I think this is yeah. beyond anything he could have conceptualized 20, 30 years ago. Uh, you know, you, you have a chapter in the book about poets as the unacknowledged legislators. Okay, you anticipated. World. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, what, what what I love about that chapter is it talks about the importance of culture. So much of our analysis in the public square today is about politics. It ties everything to politics. And if we can just get the politics right, everything will sort itself out. But you point out that as far back as the 19th century, you know, with the romanticism, that the the uh, the artist and the poet became the uh, a prime figure in in defining reality for us. Could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, well, the, the unacknowledged legislator, of course, is a quotation oh, yeah. from Percy Bysshe Shelley in his defense of poetry, uh, where he argues that, it, that really the people who most influence the way we think, or should it most influence the way we think, are the poets. And by poet, he means they're artists in general. I don't think he's particularly thinking about versifiers. He's thinking about those who are truly artists. And he lists, actually, a list of great philosophers in that essay. And, uh, and at the end of the list, he says, but I only consider Rousseau to be a truly great yeah. philosopher because only Rousseau was a poet, uh, yeah. which is an interesting comment. Yeah. And I yeah. think what, what Shelley touches on there is, again, it connects to Charles Taylor's notion of the social imaginary, that yes. the way we, we intuit the world is grounded in the way we imagine the world to be. And how we imagine the world to be is not the result of arguments. It's not the result of reading uh, heavy tomes. It's the result of artworks shaping our intuitions. I remember uh, Robbie George is a friend. I was privileged to be on Robbie's program at Princeton for a year. And his book that he co-authored with Sheriff Gerges and uh, Ryan Anderson, What is Marriage? Right. I think it's the most brilliant defense of traditional marriage yeah, I've ever read. But I have a suspicion but, it never yeah. persuaded anybody to yeah. change their mind. Exactly. Yeah. Because most yeah. of us don't believe what we believe about marriage because of arguments. It's because of the way we've experienced marriages, experienced families, seen them presented to us by the media. And that, to me, would be a good example of, well, you can present a good argument. But actually, there's, a, there's an artistic or aesthetic dimension to the way we think that's very important. And I should add at this point, Rod, I just started reading Kristen Laverne's data last ah, night ah, on your recommendation. Oh, fantastic. 20 pages in and I'm hooked already. So uh, it, it's, it's a great, great book. It's a book um, I spoke for the listeners. I spoke to um, Carl and Katrina about this book. Uh, we saw each other at the Touchstone Conference earlier mm -hmm. this year. Uh, get the modern translation by Tina Nunnally. It's it's much better than the 1920s English translation, but it is a full picture of uh, medieval society, medieval Catholic Norway, and it I. I I can't say enough good things about it, but it is a way to, to tie this back to the conversation. It is a way of imagining the world. I, I find myself when, when I first read it last year, I found myself so completely absorbed in this world of medieval Catholic, medieval Christian Norway. And, um, I thought that uh, it was such a, a different world from what we're we're used to now, and um, I I believe that uh, when you read things like that, you realize how much is within our control, how much we can control to create the sort of inner headspace that allows us to externalize that into something good and ordered and godly. Um, I mean, we're not going to recreate medieval Norway, but it is a really hopeful book in that sense. Yeah, and I, and I think it points to the fact that the battle we're engaged at the moment is, is, is largely a battle for the imagination. Yeah, I would, you know, yeah. 20 years yeah. ago, I'd never have thought that. I was very much a sort of dogmatic kind of Christian mm -hmm. guy. Mm -hmm. But now I realize that, that the battle we face with Christian young people growing up, it's, 
it's it's not just a battle to teach them sound Christian doctrine. It's also a battle to grab their imaginations with something that's that's good and true and real. And that's much harder to do than than simply teaching an argument. You know, Carl, you, you saying that reminds me of what Camilla Bendova, the um, the matriarch of the Benda clan in Prague, what she told me when I interviewed her for my book, Live Not By Lies, you know, I she was telling me about how she raised her kids under communism. You know, they were an activist family. The father went to prison for his anti-totalitarian activism, but she talked about how she read to them constantly, two, three hours a day, every day, including a lot of Tolkien. And I realized as she was talking that she was talking to me about how she formed the moral imaginations of her children. She didn't give them arguments about why Marxism is wrong. They couldn't have understood that as children but she rather gave them so much uh, uh, at the level, so many stories at the level that they could understand that taught them what is good, true, and beautiful. And that enabled them, it gave them a standpoint, an inner standpoint from which to judge the corrupt communist world in which they lived. And that's, I think, one of the most worrying things that that means for parents today, of course, is the way that the, the imagination of kids is being gripped by what they see on the screen. Yeah. Well, uh, it's... Abigail, it's yeah, it's being it's being uh, cannibalized um, or parasitized. I think is is the real is the real truth. You know, I think Milton um, understood this. Um, you know, um, you look at at Milton's Paradise Lost and you see Eve and, and Adam. And Adam is um, hyper intelligent, hyper rational. He's the smartest guy um, ever, right? Yeah. Um, literally, and um, he is obsessed with um, analysis and uh, understanding um, uh, what is. And yet Eve is this fascinating creature. She is um, uh, a, a, a creature that is made in conjunction with Adam, right? With God and Adam, right? It's, it's the, old, the, the original collaborative work of, of, of man and creation and, and, and comes, comes forth Eve. And she is a creature of fancy. She's a creature of the imagination. And um, I think it's telling uh, that we see both the strength and the limitations of the hyper-rational. Um, you know, uh, Satan is no idiot uh, himself. And in, in Paradise Lost, he's relieved when he sees Eve and not Adam, not because, you know, Adam can, you know, kick his butt or anything like that, but rather um, uh, there, there's this way in which um, uh, there is no rational reason, right, for Adam and Eve to, to take and eat. Um, there is only, um, you know, this, this, um, uh, corro Exer uh, exercise yeah, of will. Yeah. Well, well, but right. But the will is exercised by, by the activation of the imagination. And so, so just prior to the day of temptation, Eve is being whispered to into her ear while she sleeps and given a dream by Satan and in her dream, she sees a, a, an angel take take the the apple and eat and then they fly right and so this image of flight the flights of imagination so the next day so eve the imagination seems to be caught up in what can be right that it's sort of our access to to what is possible you know adam is sort of focused on what is and eve is focused on what is possible and and, and i i find it interesting more than interesting in the context of this conversation that the the final image the post fall image that milton leaves us with is adam and eve hand in hand sort of like what we can do with the kind of affective self is to collaborate you know between um reason and imagination like it's it's, it's a marital image uh, there at the end um and i think we those of us who are engaged in ideas and 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 and, and all these things that we we believe is very important um <clears throat> You know, I think we we forget that that the imagination is the ground. It, it is it is the the the, the space that we have to um, be part of, actively part of, and and it is the very ground that we seem to have just given over to uh, the influencers. Well, you can't raise money on that though for your right. political action committee. Yeah, Gail. you're right, and, and you can't write a big you know fan, you can't write a philosophical work you know on this. It, it doesn't it doesn't. It's hard to grift here. <laughs> it's hard to grift here. And it also raises questions about whether, you know, can humanity survive the way in which technology is changing our imagination? Yeah. yeah. And technology teaches us that we can transcend ourselves. Can mm -hmm. humanity truly survive that? I've raised mm -hmm. that question in class a couple of times with the kids at Grove recently. It, it seems to me to be a real question now. 
as to whether technological developments have become so detached from any moral framework and are simply predicated on, on human sovereignty. Can so we can, build a society on that? Yeah, can you can you go here? This is very, this is, I'm fascinated by this idea. How, how, what kind of response have you gotten? And where, where have y'all gotten as a class with this with this question, Carl? Well, Grove students are not representative. Yeah, no, I know. That's okay. Grove as a whole, they're pretty yeah. conservative. I would yeah. say, yeah, they, they share my concern. Okay. At that point, this idea that, particularly we, we talked briefly about the metaverse in class the other right. day. Right. The idea that, that we are slowly but surely divorcing ourselves from any real human relationships. If technology allows us to do that, is that a gain or a loss? And I think the answer is, I'm getting from my students, is that's a huge loss. Well, I, well, I, I, I don't know that most students in America would agree with that. Probably uh, not. Yeah, no, that's Carl's point. Yeah, I think he's Yeah, right. I mean, yeah, Grove yeah. are somewhat self-selecting, but yeah. Uh, so can well, you well go ahead with that real quick, um, Rod. Yeah. Go ahead. We'll, we'll, we'll break that down then for us. You say that most 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 student age people would disagree with that. How so, and, and why so? In other words, is there a law like if if we just com get completely uploaded to the cloud, right? That 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 you know, Carl's posing this is like, is this a good thing or a bad thing? His students are saying, well, that's a loss. Why is it that that? in most other places and perhaps even in my classroom people would be sort of like mm, well you know it's not so bad well because i i think that um the young people today have been acculturated to the to the culture of the sovereign self and the sovereign will you know back when i, I was in doing research on the Bolshevik Revolution in early 20th century Russia, Satan himself, Lucifer, became a, a symbolic cultural hero. Now, these people didn't believe in the devil, but they saw Lucifer as a hero because he defied God, he defied any notion of order to impose his own will on the world. And I think that that has, that is the, the, the he is the true God of this world, of this modern world. Uh, in the sense that young people would naturally assume, because they, they've grown up in a world where everything caters to them and to the imagination. They've grown up in a world where there are no fixed categories anymore, mm -hmm. not even sexuality, not even male and female. Uh, right. And so they, once you you are taught that it is okay to imagine these sort of things and that the world should, should uh, rise to use technology and law and, and culture, to meet those desires, well, it seems natural and right to you. So that's why I think so many young people today just don't understand the objections of people like us to transgenderism, whereas we recognize that transgenderism is the, 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 the concept, the phenomenon of transgenderism. It's not just a matter of expanding normal categories to include something different. It is the overturning of categories. It is a Nietzschean revaluation of all values or Right, Carl? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that most young people today are, are taught to believe that the world is just stuff, right. that it's, it's right. like a giant piece of Play-Doh over which we can impose our wills. And I think that's the real dividing line in society today is between those who think the world is just stuff and those who think it has some kind of moral structure. And it's hard to get any conversation going between those two groups because the, the foundational metaphysical concepts are simply antithetical to each other. How do we recover that? Is it possible? I hope so, because that's that's my work. But um, I, I, the reason I, I'm, I'm a little agitated about it this morning is I just spent the weekend um, talking with some friends in Nashville who are trying to raise money to make a documentary about Live Not By Lies. They want to magnify and boost the voices of these Christians who, uh, who survived uh, communism and who are trying to warn us all today that we're, we're entering a different kind of totalitarianism. And they told me that they travel around to conservatives and conservative Christian donors and donor organizations. And many of them have read Live Not By Lies, but they just lack this sense of urgency. They were telling, the young filmmakers were saying, it's so difficult to get Christians, even those who look out into the world and say, yeah, this is bad, it's so difficult for them to understand the um, the urgent situation that we're in. Uh, do you agree with that, Carl? And if so, why would it be? Why are why are we so content to live with this apocalypse as if it were just normal? My suspicion is that a lot of people simply aren't connecting the dots. They're looking at particular manifestations of the problem and they're seeing them as isolated issues, without realizing that you know, what we're seeing is uh, uh, the epiphenomena of a much deeper social transformation.
So, you know, people still believe that if, hey, if we get the right Supreme Court justices in place, right. everything right. will be OK. Right. If we get the right person in as president, everything will be OK. I, I think the culture has transformed in such a way that that's no longer the case. Uh, and I also think that an awful lot of people have a naive belief that the most important institutions in our lives are the political institutions. I think it's emerged very clearly over the last five years that the, the big tech organizations exert far more power over our lives than uh, politicians now typically do. So I, I think there's a, a lot of, I might, might call it well-intentioned denial going on. I mean, one of the things I've asked repeatedly over the last year and received no answer to from various Christians espousing forms of critical race theory is, yeah. If, if you buy into this, how, how do we answer the queer theory questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, no, nobody's prepared to answer that. Question. Yeah, yeah, you, you pose that in in one of your pieces. You know that 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 um, Christian elites, and I would you know, like as a Catholic, I would say that my my elite class sort of plays the same game in in slightly different ways, but but basically is playing the same game as Big Eva uh, in the evangelical circles. Um, you know, Rod, I can't speak to Orthodox circles, although I've, I've seen some of the, the problems that you've gotten in with sort of establishment Orthodox um, elites, but, academics, but really yeah. academics. Yeah, sorry. You know, but really it's it's the man it's we love talking about race because who can't get behind, um, you know, the civil rights movement, which is true and proper. Right. Yeah. But 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 as you point out, you know, it is simply the case that Christianity and pride activism uh, cannot be reconciled. Um, if you're going to maintain any kind of um, adherence to um, traditional Christianity. Yeah, I would totally agree. And, and my, my concern is that so much of the way that the race issue is being articulated is operating along the same kind of hermeneutical dynamics, for want of a better phrase, yeah, yeah. that queer theory operates. This is not the world of Martin Luther King emphasizing the universal dignity that adheres mm -hmm. to all human beings. Of course. Right. This is a, a critical theory predicated on the notion of victimhood, mm -hmm. on the notion of, of social injustices that can be very yes. hard to define in many ways. Well, I, and I think and, it's on purpose, right? I mean, I think it's purposefully um, uh, uh, ill-defined because it, it serves it serves uh, um, the, the movement, so to speak. Um, I'm struck. So I was thinking about this this morning in anticipation of our conversation. And um, the date that sticks out in my head is June 14th or June 13th, 2020. And that was a scene in which thousands of people gathered in Brooklyn for a Black Trans Lives Matter rally. I don't know if you two remember this scene, but I mean, you should, you should go on the internet and look at the scene of this. It's just mobs of people um, marching for Black Trans Lives. And, and I remember thinking when I, when I, I I saw it on Instagram or, or or Twitter, and I was like, "Surely, like that, that can't be right." I mean, that's just such a a strange niche um, reality. I mean, just from a from a from a a population standpoint, I mean, you you're talking about I don't know, like like three hundred people, I mean, a thousand people in America, and and here were thousands of people marching for Black Trans Lives Matter, and it, and it was at that point it, it it has occurred to me over, over since I saw that and been thinking about it over, over the the months and now years is that 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 there's this this fascinating overlay with with um, uh, critical race theory and queer theory, and it seems to me that queer theory is really the most corrosive of these theories as they kind of march together. I don't know what you think about that, Carl. I agree. I think that you know, one might say queer theory is the most honest of them all. In yes, some way. yes. Because queer yeah. theory, the game is clearly the destabilization of all categories. Right. Uh, for many years, I, I wondered, you know, why is it so hard to read Judith Butler when yeah. the ideas oh, she's hmm. expressing are often relatively straightforward? And I mm -hmm. came to the conclusion that actually the form is part of the message yeah. that we're supposed yeah. to be confused by reading yeah. her because yeah. what she's trying to do is create confusion about everything we have considered to be solid and stable. So queer theory in some ways is the most difficult of the critical theories to read, but it's also the most honest because the game is the destabilization of, of all categories. And interestingly, of course, as you point out uh, with the, the Black Trans Live Matter uh, protests and also the original sort of BLM mission yep. statement, yep. The connections are very clear there. Yes, yes. They, they've been sort of cleaned up in the public eye because I think <laughs> public taste will not yet tolerate yes. quite where they want to go. 
But this is what makes it very disturbing to me that Christians buy into this. And we have Christians mm -hmm. telling us it doesn't really exist. Well, mm -hmm. it does seem to exist. But, 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 but at the same time, putting pronouns in their, in their, in their Zoom link. Yeah, like, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's a it's a weird game that's going on here. And, and you know, look, it's so difficult to talk about this stuff um, because you immediately get smeared as, you know, whatever, a bigot or a racist or whatever it is. And I mean, you know, and I, I don't care anymore. You know, I, go ahead. I, I'm not. So whatever you, you can say, whatever you want to say. But it's such an effective governor of, 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 of genuine conversation. Yeah, and it's. I, I just penned a piece this morning, actually, for World Magazine about Abigail Schreier's expose yeah, of the yeah. the LGBTQ stuff in California yeah. middle schools. It's very interesting. I, I alluded in an article, in fact, it's very interesting that the term culture warrior is only applied to the right these right. days. Yeah. You can scream and shout as loudly mm -hmm. and as martially as you want on you know, in support of the pieties of progressive culture, mm -hmm. and then you're just being a valiant for truth. Yeah, if, see, you I, raise, I oh. if you raise, if you merely ask a question about the relationship between queer mm -hmm. theory and critical race theory, you're decried as a culture warrior, bigot, et cetera, right. et cetera. Yeah, the and, rhetorical and it, game is very interesting. It happens all the time. Like I see this in, you know, in my left, my, in my Catholic circles, especially on Twitter, you know, you're only a culture warrior if you stand up against, you know, the sort of the, you know, the, the sort of the, the cultural influencers, you know, that, you know, and, and I see this in church politics is like, you know, it's only people, quote unquote, on the right who are adhering to these categories of right and left. And they're just wanting to be part of, of sort of Republican Catholicism. And it's just like, yet, you know, you uh, on the left are super cozy with Joe Biden and, and, and all the Democrats, but you're not a culture warrior. You're just sort of listening to the spirit. You're being synodal. You know, you're doing all of this sort of stuff. And it's so disingenuous. It's so frustrating well, I just, this is what happens look this is what happens when you have a, among the culture creating class where you have uh an ideological monopoly um this is i i don't think they're being cynical here i think they really do believe this um, okay, okay. And i think they're, they're clearly wrong but i think they're sincerely wrong um because they think that they they have bought into the grand myth of, of modern culture which is the, you know, the myth of progress that we we are history is leading us in this certain direction. We progressives are on the right side of history. You conservatives who question any of this are the enemy of all that is good, true, and beautiful. One thing I want to bring up, though, is this discussion reminds me of the time Carl and I got to know each other. It, If I'm correct, Carl, it was uh, somebody, a mutual friend in Philadelphia put us in touch because you were at the time living in suburban Philly, and you were trying to, to raise the uh, uh, alarm of among parents about a trans policy coming to the local schools. And you found out this was, gosh, 2013, 2014. You found out that actually parents didn't care. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I was approached by, I, 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 I can't give details because the person could be, their job could be jeopardized. But I was approached by somebody who basically asked if I would co-author a letter with them to the school board about a trans policy being brought in. It was the first trans policy, I think in Pennsylvania, certainly in the greater Philadelphia area, uh, into the public school system where my own kids had gone to school. I mean, mm -hmm. they, it, was a, it was a very traditional sort of school system when my kids went through and this policy was being brought forward and would I co-author this letter? And uh, I did so, sent it to the school board, sent it to the local newspaper. The burden of the concern of the letter was, was not about bashing trans kids at all. It was about right. the implications for women's sports, uh, privacy issues relative to bathrooms. And also there was, a there was an interesting, I say nice in the sense it was very clear, there was an interesting, nice statement in the policy that if a child came out as trans at school, the school was under no obligation to tell the parents, yeah. which we pointed out in the letter meant that the school was effectively saying it had more of a right to know who the child was than the parents did. So I, I sent this to the school board and had a polite note back. I sent it to the local paper who completely, I, I thought this was a great moment when I could sort of, you know, become a local you know, <laughs> anti-hero. Local paper didn't even bother responding. So I got a, a young couple that I knew from one of the local churches to post it on their Facebook page, thinking let's drum up some parental support. And they told me two things, that one, the responses on the Facebook page from parents were, What's this guy's deal? There's nothing to see here. This is no big deal. Mm -hmm. uh, and that indicated to me these parents have no idea 
how their parental rights are about to be stripped from them. They're, they're just not thinking this thing through. And secondly, this couple told me that at barbecues, they would have parents coming up to them and saying, we're supportive of you, but we, we can't put it, you know, we don't want our names associated with it, lest our yeah. children suffer in the school. There it, then, you know, yeah. it revealed both the naivety, I think, of one group of parents and the, the fear of another, of another group. And things have gotten only worse since then. So, yeah. well, you know, when people ask you, Carl, and surely if, if they read this book, this your book, um, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self, it is going to be a real red pill moment for them. What would you suggest that they do after that? If they mm -hmm. read the book and mm -hmm. absorb its message, what mm -hmm. then? Uh, I think my, my primary advice to parents would be twofold. You know, don't give your kids smartphones. And I think you've said this many, many times, yeah. Rod. Uh, be aware of how influ cultural influence is operating on younger people. And secondly, be aware of what's going on in your local school district, in your local area. Be involved and be aware. I think the, the idea that we can, the idea that this revolution is happening elsewhere and isn't going to affect me, that's not the way it works. If we are looking at a revolution predicated on the notion of identity, identity affects everybody. And it is going to come knocking on your door at some time soon. So I would suggest be aware, be involved. Uh, don't despair. I mean, despair is simply a way of creating a self-fulfilling prophecy at this point. But be aware of the issues and be ready to push back on them. You are an ordained pastor. You've taught in seminary. Uh, what should pastors be thinking about how to confront this broader crisis that you um, you so brilliantly uh, elucidate in in your book? It's a it's a big question. I think that there are numerous things that pastors and church leaders need to be aware of at this point. First of all, I give the advice that was given to me when I when I became a pastor, and that is do not assume that anyone under the age of 30, and we can probably now say anybody under the age of 40, yeah. necessarily thinks that the Bible teaches what you think it self-evidently <laughs> teaches on issues of identity and sexuality. To, to touch on something you said earlier, Rod, it's not that younger generation of Christians are being deliberately obtuse on these things. It's just that what was obvious to our generation may not be obvious to theirs. So be prepared to teach very proactively on those things. Secondly, I would always counsel people make a big distinction between the LGBTQ movement as a political lobby group and individuals for whom this may be a very painful yeah. struggle and factor in their lives, either personally or in their families. And I think we need to be ruthless in our opposition of, uh, to the former and infinitely gracious mm -hmm. and pastoral in helping those who fall into the latter category. We should not allow the simple taxonomies of right and left to, to make us forget that there are individuals, mm -hmm. human beings being damaged by this stuff that we need to care for. And thirdly, just on a broader issue, I would say every pastor, every priest, uh, every uh, elder board, every session should think about chatting to a lawyer uh, in, in, the, in the coming months Get a lawyer to look at the, the local bylaws you have for your church. Just make sure that there are no loopholes there. That, that, that uh, For example, when I was a pastor, we changed the rules about who we would marry in our church to restrict it to members of our church, simply to make sure that we weren't going to be subject to somebody turning up on our doorstep as a gay couple, demanding right. I marry them, right. and then suing me when I said no. We wanted a... a, a uh, and also think about legal situations relative to Zoom, YouTube, even online giving. I think there are a lot of tech questions that are coming up that, that pastors may well, well want to get some advice on, not because they're facing a problem now, but because they may face a problem in the next five to 10 years. You know, I, I believe Alliance Defending Freedom, the uh, Christian nonprofit or, or legal organization that defends religious liberty. Uh, a few years ago, they had a program uh, that you could uh, download uh, from adflegal.org, adflegal.org, uh, a, a guide, general guide for congregations and Christian schools for how to position yourself to, to protect yourself 
from these lawsuits, you know, that nobody is going to be completely insulated from them. But there are things you can do, as you say, Carl, things congregations, Christian schools and organizations can do to better your odds of surviving any kind of um, any kind of legal assault. But our Supreme Court is making it more and more difficult. You know, I was recently out in, Col- in uh, Colorado talking about this and someone uh, I spoke with someone who knows the family of Neil Gorsuch, the the uh, the justice first one appointed by Trump and the one who led the way in reading gender ideology into employment law with the Bostock decision. And this person said, oh yeah, well, you know, Neil's sister is gay. I'm like, well, there, there it is. There right, it is. Right, right. Yeah. You know, what, this is the thing we see over that, tr- that Trump's logic and reason and all that. If somebody has in their lives uh, mm-hmm. a gay or a transgender person, it tends to completely skew everything. And yeah. And, and on that line, Rod, I would also recommend just broadly for parents, pastors, but also parents, read Abigail Schreier's book on irreversible damage, irreversible oh. damage, because what what's very helpful there and was very helpful for me was how she highlights the way that YouTube, TikTok tutor kids on coming out on this stuff. And I think yeah. it's important. Like, like literally, I think I think, have, I, yeah, I think I think our <clears throat> audience needs to understand, like, this is literally how it happens online. You're, you're yeah. not being hyper. You're not being hyperbolic at all. It's literal tutoring. There, there is real tutoring out there, and I think parents need to know the playbook, because one of the the key things with the trans kid is they're going to say, "If you don't support me, I'm going to kill, kill myself." myself. <clears throat> well, as a parent, we know right. the worst thing you want to hear from your kid is, "I'm going to kill." You'll do anything in that situation. They've absolutely got you over a barrel. Mm-hmm. Well, it's helpful to know that that may just be a trick. <clears throat> mm-hmm. It's it's something they're tutored in. So read Abigail Schreier, be aware of how your kids are being influenced by these things, not just in general, but in specifics. You know, Carl, the more I read about the, what, what we're dealing with uh, in your book or, or reading, and reading the daily headlines, the more frustrated I am with the church in general, I mean, and, uh, <clears throat> Protestant, Catholic, Orthodox, how we in the church, broadly speaking, and specifically the institutional church leaders, just are not <clears throat> responding to what's actually happening in the real world. It's as if we built this Maginot line to fight the battle that we want to fight. And, and the Germans just walk right around. <laughs> yeah, they're just coming around. Into, uh, can, can you share with us your thoughts uh, generally about the church and be as specific as you like, because um, I mean, you yeah. come out of a Protestant tradition so, yeah. uh, and you've written critically about yeah. big evangelicalism. I, I think that my experience of church, both at a, at a sort of local level and at a, a sort of bigger movement level is, it's full of people who will always find 10 righteous reasons not to do the right thing, if I can put it that way. And Boom. I had a good example Boom. recently. I wrote, a, yeah. I wrote an article uh, at First Things on the amicus brief on the Dobbs case by the, the women athletes. And I, my, my point was the way these women athletes are talking about their bodies is, is interesting. Their body's not part of them. They're instruments to them achieving selfhood, mm-hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Well, I then spend the morning engaged in some correspondence with a professor of philosophy who thinks I've misrepresented Descartes in this 800-word <laughs> first things blog post. And it's a kind of... <laughs> Come on, man, the, the world's going to hell in a handcart, and you're querying yeah. my views of Merleau-Ponty and Descartes in this, <laughs> wow. in this article. And, and, okay, maybe I didn't represent Descartes fairly, but that wasn't the point. I raised that issue because, to me, it's been emblematic of the way a certain strand of the religiously conservative movement operates. You know, they love distancing themselves. From if responsibility. They can. Yeah, yeah, from those yeah. who are... It may be speaking the truth, but may, maybe speaking it ineptly in some way, but, but essentially making the main point. Yeah, you know, you, you, you use this phrase in some of your pieces, you know, you're talking about the officer class. Um, and one of the things that Rod and I have talked about before is um, uh, Aaron Wren in his uh, newsletter, The Masculinist. Um, it's really a fantastic um, work that he, he now does, I think, full time. But in one of his earlier um, newsletters, he talks about the three basic sort of standpoints uh, of, of, of the way in which Christianity um, occupies the public square. And, you know, he said for a time there, it was, you know, pro-Christian, 
And then for a short time throughout the 90s, it was neutral. And now decidedly, certainly in the wake of, of, of the, the Supreme Court decisions, it is an openly hostile world in which Christians occupy the public square. Um, why is it that the officer class, as you call it, and I love that phrase, I use it myself now, why is it that the officer class either refuses to acknowledge that or has decided, you know what, I'm just going to go in that direction myself? I mean, any any individual member of the class could have their own personal reasons, but I suspect that they fall under a number of broad categories. One, the officer class likes being the officer class. Yeah. They like being respected. They like yeah. uh, being invited to the Manhattan cocktail parties, this kind of thing. And, yeah. uh, and they also have a, a deep dislike and distrust of what one of my colleagues at Grove would call the great evangelical unwashed, yeah. that they yeah. want to distance themselves from some of the, well, certainly uh, the dis behavior, if you like, that I would want to distance myself mm. from, mm. but that I don't see as being the primary danger that we face in the United States today. So I think there's a, there's a, yeah, I use the example of Schleiermacher in my first yeah. things. Yeah, I saw that. This. And I think, you know, a charitable read of Schleiermacher is, he wants to make Christianity plausible to yeah. the intellectuals of his day. And, and an maybe, uncharitable. And, and maybe palatable. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, an uncharitable read of him is he rather likes mm -hmm. being both a Christian and a member of the, the intellectual class. Mm -hmm. And he's trying to find a way to marry the two together. And that's why I th in the article I said, and I think this was one of the things that so upset David French, who wasn't even in my mind when I wrote that's the article. Funny. Uh and launched, a, uh, he wrote this piece about me two days before he arrived on the Grove City campus. Oh, it was very amusing. But uh, one of the points I made in the article was that in, in, in a sort of perverse sense, Trump was a kind of gift to these people yeah. Yeah. because Trump allowed yeah. them to say, we are not associated with evangelicalism as it mm -hmm. supports Donald Trump. You can trust us because we are respectable. Uh, human beings. Well, I don't want to be a jerk about this, um, but you know, it's uh, you know, if you look at uh, you know the you know David was writing you know for National Review before Trump, and now he's um, works at Time Magazine, The it's Atlantic, not, The Atlantic. No, it's Time Magazine now. Really? Okay. Yeah, wow. I just saw him live this weekend. He had a little Time Magazine under his under his under his name. You know, so look, I mean that that's nice. I mean that that that's a I'm sure it, I'm sure it's good there. Um, <laughs> sorry, I don't want to be sorry to, to take the conversation down a notch here, but that that well, within what, what is there hope for an officer class that can sort of fall back in love with its its soldiers, its people? I, I think what we'll see in the next five years is a major winnowing out in in evangelicalism and Protestantism. I suspect the same will be true in uh, Roman Catholicism and sure. Eastern Orthodoxy as well, but we'll look different because of the different mm -hmm. yeah. cultures and different leadership structures there. Mm -hmm. But I think what you'll see in, in evangelicalism and Protestantism is a division between, I would put it, between those who will stand and those who will not stand in what's coming. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, it, it's difficult to say who will be on which side at this point. But recent events, for example, at World Magazine, uh, I don't know if you followed those, but there's been transformations at World Magazine that uh, would indicate a, a, a separating out of what's going on uh, here. I think institutions like the Gospel Coalition are yeah. going to, you know, they, they've got to come down on one side or the other. The days when, you know, both sides, if you like, in Protestantism were able yeah. to operate on the same page, that's vanishing. That's vanishing at this point. Yeah, I, and I, I'm, I'm friends and I follow of the work of um, Paul Vanderclay. He's a Christian Reformed Church pastor out in Sacramento, and he's he's been talking about you know what's coming at synod at synod for for his congregation will will more than likely result in the destruction of the entire um, denomination, o yeah, over I mean, specifically over <clears throat> the um, gay marriage and and, and whatnot. Yes, and I think uh, my own denomination, the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, nothing to do with Eastern Orthodoxy, by right. the way, Rod. We, we did occasionally when I was pastor have people coming in and oh, wondering, funny. this doesn't look like your usual yeah. Orthodox church. Where, where are the icons? Are the icons? I, I, yes. and, and there's no smoke. I see no smoke in here. I, you know. <laughs> but uh, we, we are comparatively peaceful. We're, we're a small and irrelevant sect in many mm -hmm. ways. So, But the Presbyterian Church in America, which is the biggest conservative 
Presbyterian denomination is facing major division, I think, over the issue of, uh, of homosexuality at this point. Not so much the issue of gay marriage, but the issue of is it okay to identify as gay while remaining celibate? That, I think, is the big issue for them. But that's emblematic of what's going on in a whole lot of denominations. These identity politics issues are coming to the surface and I think will be, they'll be very traumatic for the denominations that are facing them. You know, I, uh, I, I'm mindful of the time here. We're running out of time. Uh, I want to get your opinion, though, on some things that we're seeing happen in the conservative uh, political world uh, among certain Christians. And I'm, I'm thinking about people that Kale and I have talked about before on this podcast, the integralists, the Catholic integralists, who seem to think that uh, we are at a moment now when uh, one should be pushing hard for some sort of revival of uh, a way of thinking that that brings church and state closer together for the sake of the common good. And I, I think that their basic critique that we lack a sense of the common good is is bang on. I mean, that's true. We, we've lost it. This is, you know, Alistair McIntyre 101. But they seem to have this idea that uh, the sort of, I call it the grand inquisitor option, the idea that if, you know, if Christians, and in their case, Catholics in particular, can capture the, uh, the lawmaking institutions, then we can somehow bring the culture back around by, by legislative fiat. And I, I think that is just bonkers. But what do you think? I think it's bonkers too. Uh, I mean, conservative Catholics don't even control their own church at the moment. You know, how on I, earth I, are they I, going to control I, I the United s- States of America? I can speak to that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it seems to me, I, I, I would, agree. yeah, in some ways, rather like, yeah, I want to affirm what's being, what's being hoped for. Yeah, it would be wonderful to see a society that, that was organized along lines where, you know, people didn't commit adultery, where there no, were no abortions, where, mm-hmm. where Christian love characterized what went on. But I think the situation we're in now makes that an absolute pipe dream. Um, Protestantism has its equivalence with the theonomists who right, right. You know, think we can return to the 16th century rather than the, the 12th century. But again, it's, it's nonsense. I mean, I would say to Protestants who say to me, your writings are defeatist. My comment is, well, you know, give me one conservative Protestant Supreme Court justice and I'll acknowledge I'm a defeatist. You can't even deliver that. Yeah. So I think these, these ideas are... They're, they're great thought experiments, but if you're living in the real world, we've got to think about practical solutions. And I think your focus on the local, that's where we have real influence. I mean, you and I can write stuff and, and people read it, and maybe they're influenced by it, but the people I have most influence on are the students in my classroom. Uh-huh, uh-huh. I, I think we need to focus ourselves on influencing our local communities for the good. Well, and, and I think that uh, we can't, we can't know what's coming next, right? This is one of the, the things that people said about Patrick Deneen's book, Why Liberalism Failed, uh, is that they said his final chapter was weak because he didn't come up with clear, concise <clears throat> solutions. Mm-hmm. And, but I think his last chapter was honest because he said that we have been so saturated in classical liberal categories that it's very hard to think beyond those categories. And so the best we can do, according to Patrick Deneen in 2018 or whenever he published his book, the best we can do is to work locally to sort of and, and hope that eventually some new order will emerge out of healthy local communities. Now Patrick seems to have flipped and he's gone over to the integralist side and is looking for some a more robust response from the government. And I, I think I understand why he's gotten there. He's working uh, within uh, academia, as are you, and he's seeing things, the, the noose tighten around any free thought. But um, I, I just, to me, when I hear uh, these, these good men talk about what they want to see, it, it seems to me like a, a cul-de-sac, a dead end. Yeah, it's, it's a kind of nostalgic nostalgic thing in many ways and it's just not practical clearly i suppose the government could pass certain protections that would help higher education for example defend free speech etc etc but in terms of a major transformation of society i think it a it can't be government led because it is part of the cultural imagine it's the battle for the cultural imagination we're looking at and secondly 
Christianity is in decline in the United States. That's not the moment when it's going to take over and solve all of the problems. Again, one doesn't want to be a defeatist, but I think we're in a time of we're in a time of retrenchment at this point, not a time of expansion. You know, and I, and I think that when the church acts in positions of weakness, it tends to act poorly. Um, I mean, almost that's sort of become my 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 new thing. You know, as as a, as a conservative traditional Catholic, you know, as I look back in the history of my own church, you know, it is, um, you know, as a kid, I used to think, for instance, something like Trent was, you know, that's a full throated, you know, really sort of calling it like it is sort of thing. And as I've, as I've immersed myself more deeply into the history of what actually happened and all of it, it's like, no, actually, this is a church um, behaving high handedly in precisely the time in which it should not have acted so and that and that's almost you know universally <clears throat> true and so i wonder you know with with, with the, our integralist friends i mean you know what what would what do you think of somebody like tom holland i mean what would tom holland say about this sort of this integral this integralist um concept that we can return to some sort of 12th century model either of you i don't know if, if you know where i'm going at with this i mean because he has such a, an eccentric and interesting um read on the history of the west um that i think is fascinating um so i wonder what he would say about all this i don't know tom holland well enough to uh, sorry what he would sorry. say yeah. but well because he he's arguing that that we all live we're all christians right whether whether we are professing christians or not and so i wonder what how he would characterize um liberalism as the way that we keep talking about capital l liberalism you know as a, a as, as fundamentally a christian phenomenon um so anyway so maybe maybe for mm -hmm. later i mean this isn't to answer that question Kel, mm -hmm. but it is to make the point of course that the other side of it is the 12th century was only possible because of the technology of the 12th century right. you know technologically I, I think the question of, of whether, the, whether build, the nation, build that out yeah build that out just real well, i was gonna say the, the the idea of the, to me one of the big questions we haven't touched on it in, mm -hmm. in this program but one of the big questions in the coming years not a specifically christian one but a political one is whether the the idea of the nation can survive right. Right. Nations are imagined communities. Right. Right. Technology is transforming mm -hmm. the way we imagine our communities. Mm -hmm. uh, integralism, as I understand it, still depends upon a certain notion of the nation state that may well not apply mm -hmm. in 20, 30, 40 years time. Uh, and so there are all kinds of questions, material questions so about like, the shape of the future. Yeah, so like nation state as a kind of technology um that that can't survive a, 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 a sort of successor um technology that's a yeah. really interesting that's really interesting i mean when you think a nation yeah. state is not just geographical because the texan in el paso yeah. feels an identity with somebody in vermont they don't feel with the mexican just over the border so it's yeah. not just geographical right it's about big national narratives well right Technology is shattering those national narratives with the way it projects right. news from all over the world into our room as if it was happening just next door. Yeah. Immigration is shaking national narratives. I say to the students in class, 1619 or 1776, <laughs> I, I have no, I'm an immigrant. I don't yeah. have any dog in that fight. But the fact that the fight exists tells me yeah. that the national narrative is in trouble at this point. Yeah. And that raises questions about the viability or the nature of the nation state that then raise questions about such things as integralism or theonomy or whatever that are predicated on the idea that you can have a geographically bounded imagined community. You know, you saying that brings to mind a conversation I had in Hungary this summer, you know, Hungary, the famously fascist state in Central Europe that the media tells us. Anyway, I, I'm a big admirer of Hungary and its conservative Christian leader. He's Calvinist, um, Viktor Orban. But uh, I was at a, a Fidesz party event, Fidesz is Orban's party, and talking to a, a supporter of the government, a man who's about my age, mid-50s, and he said that his own sons, who are older teenagers, young adults in their 20s, have told him they would refuse to fight for their country if it were invaded. And he found that, I mean, he's a conservative himself, mm. and um, we didn't have time at a cocktail party conversation to draw that out, but... You know, his idea, as I understood it, was that his sons 
no longer see their identity as Hungarian, that they have been acculturated by social media and the internet in ways that his parents' generation, our generation, just haven't been. And it's something that the adult generation, the parental generation, grandparent, they just can't even occupy the same headspace as these young people. It, it after what's happened to Hungary in the 20th century, the idea that you would not fight for the sovereignty of your nation is just beyond conception for people who live through it. And yet they have produced a generation now that doesn't share those views at all about their nation. Yeah, and you, you see a parallel in the in the United Kingdom, maybe not at quite such a high, le- a high stakes level, but I was struck in 2020 that George Floyd protests erupted in Britain yeah, yeah. at the same time as Hong Kong there was much violent and terrible abuse going on in Hong Kong, which was a British colony until 1997. I watched the handing over of Hong Kong on the TV live as it occurred. Mm-hmm. Nothing. Only, only Chinese immigrants protested, it seemed, about the Hong Kong issue in Britain in 2020. Uh, young people in Britain, their imaginations much more gripped by incidents in Minneapolis than incidents in Hong Kong. And that, to me, showed a major shift in, in national imagination. Well, you know, what is a border? I mean, what is a nation um, in the era of Wi-Fi? Yeah. Uh, it, I, you know, I don't know what it means now. Yeah. Um, you know, I know what it means, like, physically. You know, I know what a border is physically, uh, you know, uh, in terms of, like, spaces and, you know, rivers and lakes and mountains and ranges. I mean, I understand what that means in terms of, like, a city, maybe. But really, but if you sort of take this sort of this meta, well, and what does a what does a border mean in the age of meta, right? I mean, this is the this is this is the the kind of uh, liquid uh, hyper modernity. liquid modernity that that Rod always talks about. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I, Michael uh, Hanby uh, at Catholic U, the philosopher of science, says that the sexual revolution is just a technical technological revolution applied to the body. And I think that what you're talking about, Carl, it brings that to mind that, that you know, maybe this technological revolution applied to the level of the nation state is the dissolution of national mm. consciousness, which is a, a utopian goal of the Marxist from right. the 19th century, you know, but and uh it's it's a well well to go back to now ha- yeah to go back to hamlet you know in in in, in the, the days of hamlet the king had two bodies um but now we have no king and we have no body i mean yeah. it's um well uh to, to wrap it up carl i know we're we're conscious of your time here yeah. um i one of the things that i'm or the thing i'm going to work on next for my next book is the recovery of a sense of sacred order uh as a pre um I mean, I, I'm writing it just simply because I think it's true and I think it's necessary. We're seeing young people coming to our, our Orthodox parish here in Baton Rouge during COVID. And they keep saying, we say, why do you come? We're glad to see you, but why, why Orthodoxy? And they say, because it's real. And I think that means a lot of different things. Yeah. But the, uh, one core thing I believe they're, they're trying to articulate, but they can't really because they're so young, is that this this makes a strong Orthodox Christianity makes a strong proclamation of the reality of sacred order and the necessity of ordering our own individual lives around that authoritative proclamation of sacred order. So I want to talk in my, the next phase of my work about recovering that. Um, Do you think that's, that's useful or do you think that the real fight is uh, on another, in another sphere? No, I think that's incredibly useful. Uh, as we, we alluded to earlier, I think the battle is a battle for the imagination at this point, and, and how we think and intuit the world is, is vital. And I'm struck by, I, I try to press on the students at Grove that the people they sit next to in the lecture theatre, the friendships they have, these are, can be the most important things in their lives, that it's actually our embodied relationships that are, that are critically important. And that's a particular way of imagining the world to be. And I think what you're pointing to there is just that played out on a, on a broader scale, I think, an engagement with the world as it really is, as opposed to the way we want it to be, has to be critical. I'm relatively optimistic, for example, on the transgender front, not, not optimistic that it's, it's going to go away without a huge amount of pain. But I think transgenderism is so unreal that in 100 years time, we'll look back on it in the way we look back on lobotomies mm-hmm. today. Uh, Tragically, a lot of people have got to suffer in the meantime right. in order right. to do that. 
But I do think uh, reality has a way of biting back and encouraging people to think about reality before they get harmed by dismissing reality mm. is a very important thing. So, Raleigh, I, I think that book sounds fascinating and important. The world is not just stuff. Right. We have to cure our young people from thinking that the world is just stuff in order for them to flourish, in order for and, them and, to live and rich, they are, and, lives. And that they are not just stuff, right? No. I mean, I, I think what strikes me with what you're saying here is like, you know, what happens 20, 30 years down the row here when 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 a, a huge swath of people have effectively sterilized themselves and have cut themselves off from access to immortality and cut themselves off of access to a legacy. I think this is going to be tremendously um, awful and painful. And, and, I, and I say that not as a triumphalist. I mean, I am deeply... Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, struck and saddened by by what what the implications of this ma current madness um, portend for so many young people. I mean, you know, I, I, I can and I admit I, I have sort of chuckled as I've scrolled through the libs of TikTok um, site, you know, but but the, the 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 mass psychosis on display here should be really um it well, it's depressing um but it's more than that i don't you know it's, it's diabolical it's, it's the tearing yeah. apart of society yeah. Yeah. And the tearing apart of the individual psyche i mean it, it is this is an apocalypse i don't know if it's yeah. the apocalypse but right. it is an apocalypse and mm -hmm. solzhenitsyn said you know if you talk to he said this about conditions like 40 50 years ago he said if you talk to people of ages past about what actual conditions they would recognize it clearly as an apocalypse but today yeah. we're just comfortable with it we just keep right. rolling right right well um carl uh last question what's next for you what are you uh, what what <clears throat> book is coming out from your pen next I'm doing a book, uh, sort of introduction to critical theory, the origins of critical theory for Broadman and Holman. They wanted somebody to do uh, something looking at critical theory from a Christian perspective, expounding it, but also pointing out its deep and problematic flaws. So that's what I'm working on at the moment. Got a whole pile of Theodore Adorno and the Frankfurt School just to my right. Um, oh my gosh, you're, 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 for your for your sins, Mar Marcusa, <laughs> for sins, Marcusa yes. and the boys, man. That's uh, oh good gosh, luck. yes, yeah. yes. And, <laughs> and uh, rise and triumph of the modern self. It's still selling well, I take it. And uh, as far as I know, still in the top ten thousand in Amazon, which I assume sweet. is is a decent place to be. So. No, no, it is because people when I, I've done some traveling this year uh, around, around my own book, and wherever I go, people are talking about your book because yeah. it is that important it gives that we we're so confused we're all this has happened so quickly in our culture and people are lost in the fog and trying to feel their way through it and when pastors and parents and ordinary christians discover your book the rise and triumph of the modern self it opens a door for them it's clarifying and that's exactly what i'd hoped for when i when i first brought the subject up with you and you just written way beyond what i could have hoped for so thank you so much you've given yeah. a, the church all of the church such yeah. a great gift in this book it's very kind of you to say that rod and thanks for your support and encouragement you are the you're the best publicist i've ever had you're the <laughs> only publicist i've ever had and i've never paid you other than <laughs> yeah, just, bread. just just pay so. me pay me in shortbread <laughs> yeah in shortbread. that's right that's right I knew, yeah, it, I knew it would come back. It would come back to short bread. So. <laughs> anything <laughs> else, Dale, you want to? No, we're good. It's, it's, thank you so much for coming on, Carl. It's really been a treat for me personally. So thank you. And uh, Carl and I will be together in uh, January at in Wichita, Kansas at the Eighth Day Institute <sighs> Symposium. And I, I, I encourage you to um, listeners to go to Eight Day uh, Institute, I guess it's eight day Institute.org. Uh, I, I don't know for sure, but look the links into this. below the link is below link in the is description. Below. Uh, go, please go to this conference. I've been to it several times in the past. It's wonderful. You get together with really smart Christians. It's uh, ecumenical in the best sense. And you all get to shop repeatedly at eighth day books in Wichita, which is the <laughs> world's greatest Christian bookstore. I can't say enough good things about it, but you'll want to come listen to Carl and, and maybe even to me, because uh, we're talking about things that are hugely important for the church in a time of, of great crisis and a crisis that's going to get much darker before the light shines. And uh, let's let's come together and, and equip each other as believers to resist. So yeah. anyway... Thank, right. thank you. Thank you, Carl, for coming on today. We really appreciate it. We'd love to have you back sometime. And um, Kale, this is what I got to tell you, bro. Yeah, do it. Don't, don't get nothing on you. <laughs>